Thank you for joining us. This is part three of our four part series, the introduction to traditional Chinese medicine. Um, and I really wanted to do this series about the fundamental theory basics um, as a way to demystify some of the language around Chinese medicine, because um, sometimes we go into our acupuncturist's office and they start saying words and we say, I know those are English words, but I do not understand what you're talking about. And so my hope is that in these brief lectures, we can perhaps shed a little bit of light on the subject for you so that you feel more informed and empowered as a patient. Um, tonight, we're covering the basics. And, um, and we've covered the concepts in previous lectures of the yin and the yang, the five element correspondences and cycles, and the basic substances of the body, including qi, which we're going to touch on again a little bit tonight. Um, today, we're going to talk about the evils um, or the pathogenic factors according to Chinese medicine. So there are some interesting similarities and some differences about how TCM looks at illness and the lines of what is you and what is not you are drawn a little bit differently in TCM than in Western medicine. Um, there is a relative equilibrium between the human body and the external environment that is not static, but constantly adjusting. And this is a quote from one of our our theory textbooks, the uh, Chinese acupuncture and moxibustion. And um, it explains really beautifully this concept of homeostasis, um, particularly with regard to how we respond to the world around us. Because of course, um, in Chinese medicine, we don't look at ourselves as outside of the natural system. Um, we look at ourselves as part of that ecosystem. So it's important to note that um, both the conditions of our external or i.e. outside of the body and the internal strength or weakness we possess as individuals are placed with equal relevance in TCM, right? And we understand that some illness is caused by forces outside the body, but we also recognize that our ability to withstand those forces relies heavily on the relative strength of our internal chi. And in this case, that is the defensive chi or the wei chi that you might remember we talked about last week. So this is a, a diagram that represents the state of balance um, with the body, between the body and the seasonal climate that it is ha has to exist within, and therefore a body free of external disease. Um, and this, is uh, an example of the loss of that equilibrium. And in these images, we can see that illness or a state where the body is subjected to the evils of the seasonal climate happens either when the body's defensive chi or wei chi is somehow deficient or is less than, or when the forces of the evil chi of the natural environment are somehow greater than the body, even if the body is in a state of health but we look at them as relative to one another. So it would take a particularly virulent illness, for instance, to fell an otherwise healthy person. And conversely, a relatively sickly person might succumb to a mild um, or, or, you know, or what I should say, like um, uh, physiological infection. So something that sort of is natural in the world all around us. Um, my example of this, uh, that I think back to my own life when I was, um, when my daughter, my youngest daughter was two or three years old, uh, she contracted E. coli, which um, is a bacteria that we all have existing in the world. Some people have more of it than others, but when it gets into a state of excess, it causes really severe illness. So you all are afraid of that word. I'm sorry when I say my baby had E. coli. And it was true. She was terribly ill for for a few days and by the end of a few days we ended up having to take her to the hospital and she received intravenous fluids and she's better now definitely better now but um the point of the story is that when i brought her home after she'd been hospitalized and 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 her illness was beginning to improve i was going to look to ways that i could um help her rebuild her gut immunity, make sure that we could repair the intestines that were so irritated by her infection. And I went to the fridge and I grabbed out the bottle of probiotics and I, I don't know why, but I looked at the label of probiotics and um, 
there's soy was listed as an ingredient. And my youngest child has a soy allergy. And it was like a light bulb went off. I went, oh God, of course, right? For the week or two leading up to her illness, we had been uh, treating her with this probiotic that I had neglected to realize contained soy. It was trace amounts, but she's very sensitive. And so, you know, we had basically irritated the, the, her gut so sufficiently or so completely with her, her probiotic treatment that, um, that when she was exposed to an excess of coli, she got ill. Whereas, you know, you or myself or every other member of our household may have also been exposed to that same infection and we didn't fall ill. So I think it's just a really good example of how your internal ecosystem is just as important as your external ecosystem and that the natural world that we live in as well as the microbial world that we live in, you know, um, are important to how we are able to um, manage illness. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the causes of disease. Now this lecture is primarily geared toward the external causes of disease, but because we've already sort of laid out the idea that it's a battle between the internal and the external. Um, I just wanna talk a little bit. So we've got our six external evils, which, um, which are the external pathogens, right? But they're not the only cause of disease. And you'll see that oftentimes what happens is that one of the other four issues here may cause a weakness in the individual that can lead to an opportunity for the external evil to take hold and then possibly progress deeper into the body to create internal illness. So um, some of the other causes of disease that we have are the seven emotions. Uh, we always use the emotions when we're looking in Chinese medicine. Uh, we don't separate emotional health from physical health. It's all part of the same organism. Uh, improper diet, these lifestyle things, improper diet, strain, stress, decreased exercise. Um, you know, in the case of my daughter, I look at that improper diet, right? She has a soy allergy. She'd been eating soy for a couple of weeks. Um, was too irritated to be able to withstand um, the attack by that external influence. Traumatic injury or bites. Um, we actually do have Chinese herbs for bites and stings, which I think is fascinating. I, sort of that whole extra layer of herbal medicine that I, I don't get to practice very often, but it's interesting. Um, but traumatic injury is a factor that people don't often consider when we're looking at causes of illness. Um, we, we don't understand how strongly the body's resources are shunted to healing from traumatic injury. So if you've had a broken bone or if you had to go in for surgery and things like that, you should expect and understand that your immune system and your defenses might be a little weakened just because your body doesn't have all the resources it needs to sort of take care of all those different fronts. Um, and then also phlegm or blood stasis, which are internal conditions. Um, we talked a little bit last week about blood and how that works or last time we talked. And then phlegm is just um, sort of a, a more progressed version of, of what we will talk about later called damp. So, but um, in this case, I would say phlegm might've been another contributing factor to my daughter's E. coli infection because her allergy is a physical manifestation of phlegm in the body. That's how Chinese medicine would characterize those kinds of allergies. So um, it's, it's interesting just to see and note that there are also other causes of diseases. And, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how these external pathogens translate internally, because almost all of them, even though they do come outside from outside and are associated with seasonal changes, they also can progress internally. And the internal versions and the external versions actually can oftentimes look very similar. So that should give you a bit of a, a groundwork for when we're looking at that. So the other thing to remember when we're talking about external evils is that they are seasonal pathology. So in Chinese medicine, external pathology is connected to the in external environment um, and the changing of the seasons. Uh, when I say external here, I'm specifically talking about outside the body pathology is just when things aren't quite right, right? And you might recognize this common theme developing here, right? You know, uh, we are always reminded of the natural world and TCM um, and how the patterns of our bodies are connected to the natural cycles of the world. It's one of the things I love about it. It's part of its elegance. Um, but um, it's another reason why you might hear a TCM practitioner say that an ideal treatment plan 
for an otherwise healthy individual should include an assessment or treatment once every three months or so at the changing of the seasons. And this is to ensure that your body is working at its optimum function before heading into these periods where we're sort of most susceptible to disease. So at the changing of the seasons, if you're having unseasonable weather, this uh, summer in Argyle has actually been very cold um, and wet. Uh, we had an 11 degree night the other night um, after a nice warm spell. And so those sharp changes in the weather or um, changes that are maybe unseasonable, these kinds of things can cause weaknesses in your body because of course it's being asked to adapt and change and it's having to put resources toward those changes. So. Um, and then, of course, your constitutional conditions, right, um, will also affect how your illness manifests, right? So those are all things to consider when we talk about external diseases. Um, I'm going to briefly go over the six main external evils or the external pathogens, uh, and then we're going to talk more in depth about infectious illness and its progression, because you will see while each of these has their own season, most of them can also occur really anytime and will also manifest with similar symptoms internally. So um, I wanna also take a minute when we're looking at these words, again, we're gonna clarify the language because sometimes it's confusing how TCM terminology is different, but also similar to our Western medical culture. So we're gonna do a little bit of translation and we're gonna talk about what stuff means, okay? So the six external pathogens or sources of evil chi, right? Because the external world has chi, just like you have chi, everything has chi, right? Um, the first is, is wind, and wind is associated with the season of spring. And it, its characteristics are that it changes rapidly and it moves constantly. Um, it oftentimes affects the surface um, or the upper part of the body. We'll go in later and talk about how wind is oftentimes that first sign of illness because, because it is on the outside. It's that very external layer. Like this is your defensive layer, right? But some of the common manifestations of wind in your body are hay fever, the common cold, um, skin rashes, or even Bell's palsy, where, you know, one half of your face experiences temporary paralysis. Um, so these are all expressions of wind or external wind in the body. Um, and we call it that mostly because it's descriptive of how it behaves, but also because you can contract it by being exposed to it. Um, so these are things to keep in mind. There's always that, like, the body mirrors the nature and the nature affects the body. So as we move through the list, keep that in mind. Um, cold is the next external pathogen and it's associated with the season of winter. Um, and primarily what cold does is alter the warming function. Um, I kind of love how, you know, uh, if you remember your, you know, middle school science classes where they're teaching you that the definition of cold is the absence of heat. And the same thing holds true here in Chinese medicine. So the absence of cold is in fact, um, or the absence of heat is in fact the definition of cold, right? And so um, it is mostly contracted due to exposure. So you, if you're exposed to cold in the wintertime, if you're not dressed properly, you know, this is where the whole you could catch cold comes from. You get your chill. You can maybe even have digestive or pain related illnesses, right? Things get very stiff. Pain is associated with cold. Um, you aren't sweating because your skin can't um, open the pores and allow sweat to come out because it's so cold. It's, it's protecting itself from that cold. And so those are some of the other symptoms that you will see um, and we're talking about cold, um, damp is, um, is associated with the late summer season. And uh, one of the characteristics of damp is actually that it's prolonged and intractable. So um, once damp sets in, it can sometimes be difficult to, to kick it back out again. And um, we do see that, again, if you're exposed to wetness or mold, in your environment. These are ways that we can contract damp from our, our seasonal environment. And, um, and we look at it like eczema is an ex example of damp, a lot of eczema, not all eczema, but that sort of damp, weepy sore eczema, um, swelling or edema, kind of heaviness of the limbs or the head, 
um, those are all signs of damp and damp can also turn into phlegm. So if it's left unchecked, it becomes phlegm. Um, fire is associated with uh, the summer season, right? And one of the things about fire that's interesting is it it's sort of a constellation of, of heat related symptoms. And there's three different sort of levels to it. You've got mild heat, you've got heat, and then you have fire, which is of course very intense heat. So um, when you're looking at fire, there, there's levels there. And mostly what fire does um, is it manifests, it, it increases your blood circulation. So you'll see it when you're looking at a fever or your pulse rate increases. And sometimes it will increase that blood circulation to the point where it's sort of pushing blood out of where it belongs and you'll get bleeding signs as well. Um, it can also stir up the, the liver a little bit and, and generate what we would call internal wind, which can then manifest as things like insomnia or mania. So um, even though that's wind related, we associate the mania and the insomnia actually with heat signs. Um, and then because the fire element is also associated with the heart, you'll see that there's, there's um, and the heart is associated with the mouth, you'll see oral um, ulcers, tongue ulcers, bleeding gums, things like that. Mouth symptoms will happen a lot with fire. Um, and then in general, we're talking about heat signs, right? Things that are hot and in varying degrees of intensity, mild, moderate, and then fire. Dryness is associated with the autumn season and primarily impairs the lung. So it enters the nose and the mouth and it tends to dry the mucous membranes. And um, you'll see dryness, you know, it happens depending on when you're exposed to the dryness of the autumn season. We tend to get those, those dry skin rashes or, or we will get those dry coughs or chapped lips, those kinds of things. That's all external dryness. And then summer heat is the oddball here. It only happens in the summer and you will only see it as an external condition. So all of these other evils, evil chi, you can see that as internal pathology. So those similar symptoms will manifest as an internal pathology where summer heat only happens externally and it only happens in the summer. It doesn't happen in any other season. Um, and it, it mostly is due to extreme heat exposure. So you'll see heat stroke and dehydration, high fevers, lots of thirst, lots of sweating, and it is often paired with dampness. So you will oftentimes see when you see heat and damp together and it's the right season, that's a summer heat situation and you would treat that accordingly or, or as a practitioner, I would treat that accordingly. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about wind um, because because wind is a really common initial source of illness. Um, and the character for wind has within it um, the character of insect. So I think this kind of indicates for us that long ago, the Chinese understood the concept of a microbial infection. Um, and just, you know, they, they knew that a bug, when you caught wind, you caught a bug, just like we say today, right? So while it's not always a one-to-one -one comparison, Mostly, we understand in TCM that when you're talking about external wind invasion, you're talking about an upper respiratory infection, um, viruses and bacteria. But again, it's oftentimes our individual constitutional conditions that will affect the symptom presentation, which is why some folks will have different symptoms, even when they're infected with the same microbe, right? Um, and uh, it is said that wind is the leading causative factor of many diseases. And this is a quote from one of our classical Chinese texts. Um, but, um, you know, there are at least four different schools of classical TCM, mostly herbalism and herbal related, that deal directly with the progression of disease from the external to the internal. So wind tends to be that first entrance of disease into the body. And um, we almost always miss the early signs of a growing illness, which um, in TCM is what we would call a wind cold. And I think it's schools like the Shan Hong Wen, which deals with cold illness that evolved to help us better understand that progression so that we could catch it as it was happening. Later on, um, the classical Chinese theory of the Wen Bing, which is dealing with warm diseases, 
you know, that progression begins with the description of what we would call wind heat, um, which you may better understand as things like the influenza, chicken pox, or SARS um, are some examples of what we would call wind heat. But, um, but again, understanding the progression of that, that, that we begin with wind cold and then it goes to wind heat and then it goes deeper and deeper into the levels of the body and to be able to identify where you are in that process and to be able to understand that it, a lot of it starts with wind. And so when we're talking about how we're managing our external environment, even though you have six evils and they all pertain to different seasons, many illnesses, most illnesses, begin with wind. And I find this very empowering because I think that um, it arms us with some of the knowledge we need to prevent illness. This is where preventative medicine gets very, very handy for us. Um, it's important to remember that wind by its very nature changes rapidly. And so oftentimes by the time we recognize one stage of wind, it's progressed or is on its way to progressing to a different stage. I always advise my patients that catching illness early is the key. And so I thought today I would just share with you my top three early signs of an external illness. So these are things that oftentimes go unnoticed that we don't think about and we don't pay attention. So, um, you know, by the time you have a scratchy throat, you're well on your way to wind heat and, and you're basically already sick. So, so taking the time to really pay attention to these early symptoms can help. So um, remember that you can only come down with an illness if your defensive systems are feeling weak. And so truly the first signs of illness are the feeling of fatigue, and an aversion to wind, right? Wanting to not go out into the wind um, and, and feeling tired, like you need to lie down and have a nap. Um, and then the next one that comes is a feeling of being chilled, like, oh, I just kind of feel a little cold. Maybe I need to put on a sweater, um, put on a, wear a blanket. Um, or my favorite, you know, in Chinese medicine, when I started going to school, we all kind of would laugh because, you know, everybody starts off where they are, right? You look at your teacher, all the Chinese teachers are always wearing socks, always. I went to school in California. We're barefoot people, we're sandal people, right? But like nobody's wearing socks. But by the time you graduate from Chinese medicine school, everybody is wearing a scarf, always, just always. Because when you leave your house, you put something around your neck and you probably take it off three or four times a day, but you have it um, and you, you protect your neck, right? This part right back here where we're, we're protecting ourselves and what we're really protecting ourselves from is the wind. So, um, so that's funny. And then just to remember that uh, external invasion comes in through the skin, the mouth and the nose. And so sneezing, well, obviously to most people it is innocuous and, and sneezing in and of itself doesn't mean that you are contagious or that you have an illness, but really it's our body's way of forcefully ejecting a pathogenic factor, right? When you sneeze, you're trying to, you know, get it off, try to throw off that wind. And, um, you know, we consider hay fever to be wind, but, you know, hay fever is also an indication of a weakened immune system. We also, we treat hay fever like we would treat a weak immune system. And so um, don't ignore your sneezes and use them as a reminder that the body needs care. So if you have any of these symptoms, fatigue, you're feeling chilled, you're sneezing, you don't have to, you know, that doesn't mean that you're sick. But what it means is that your body's asking you to take care of it. So it's when you go put on a sweater, have a cup of tea, um, you know, take a nap if you need to. Make sure that you avoid the things that would put more stress on your body, like um, like sugar and and um, and caffeine or greasy foods, things like that. So this is just an indication that that you need to care for your body at this time. Um, and uh, as promised, I want to talk a little bit about infectious illness, because how can you not? We're currently living through a pandemic. And, um, you know, in our village, just this last couple of weeks, there's been a, a large resurgence of, of cases. And so um, the exterior pathogenic factor is so strong that the majority of members or a community will fall ill 
and the strength of the body's chi in relation to the pathogenic factor plays a role in resistance to the disease, as not all members of the community ever fall ill. And this is Giovanni Macciocha talking about warm epidemic pathogenic factors. So these is the, this is the Chinese medicine theory about you know, epidemic illness. Um, and there's a lot of writing about epidemic illness in Chinese medicine. You know, we forget that these kinds of, of illnesses that are hot, they're highly contagious, they move fast, and they, they tend to be very, very serious and severe. Um, they're not new, right? I mean, they are new because each one is new, but um, the presence of these things and, and our battle as humans against them in our, within our environment, this is not a new thing. So we have a lot of writing about this in Chinese medicine. And, um, and in, in these cases, I think this quote just illustrates to us that of course, our body strength is extremely important in those cases. And I just want you to remember that this is one of the reasons why when we're going through a pandemic and everyone's like, well, how come some people are asymptomatic and then some people are really sick and why it doesn't make any sense that, you know, uh, as a Chinese medicine practitioner, I, I understand completely what they're talking about. Some people are going to be asymptomatic and it's going to have everything to do with the, the strain that they catch and the condition of their constitutional immunity, right? Um, in Western medicine, the focus is all on the pathogen. You know, you think that that positive COVID-19 test means that you have one illness. And in TCM, we look at the balance of the body. We look at and see, so it's not just one illness, it's an illness in a body and how they interact together. So um, the story is a couple of weeks ago, uh, within 24 hours, all four members of my immediate family came down with COVID. Um, I have a strict policy. Whenever anybody in the house is having symptoms of illness, we all stay home. We all shun public everything. And I do this, I did this before the pandemic. I do this all the time because signs of illness mean that your body needs to rest and, um, and illness is contagious. There's no reason to bring that out into the community. So that's always been my policy. So I closed the clinic, I canceled our talk, um, and then came to find out that I was actually very ill <laughs> for several days. Um, try being an herbalist and treating four people with COVID while well, you have no brain. It was fascinating, fun story. But um, it was an interesting story for me as a practitioner because I began to see how different people reacted differently. You know, one member of my family had really, really congested sinuses, lots, copious, copious phlegm in the nose, right? Um, and, and two members of my family had really high fevers, the other two, we had barely any fever at all. Some people had bad headaches. Some people had no headache, but a little body ache. And it was all very different how the symptoms manifested. I was the only person to lose my sense of smell. And so it's it's important that that we we understand that, again, this is the same illness. We all had the same illness, but we were all different people and it manifested very differently for all of us. So while TCM doesn't have all the answers to epidemic illness, um, I just wanna leave you with a few things that you can be gained by sort of shifting the perspective on how we approach these new virulent illnesses like, like a COVID um, and how TCM looks at that. So COVID-19 and TCM is categorized as damp toxin pestilence. And toxin here has always been associated with heat and fire and not in fact wind. Um, however, this is referring to the very severe um, ARDS, the acute respiratory distress symptom that's associated with most of the COVID fatality. In mild cases where the patient's internal resources are gonna manifest more like a traditional wind heat with fever and body aches and the headache and the dry cough, a more young constitution, like two members of my family, will manifest with a higher fever, right? But that, that's not the phase of the illness that's really the dangerous piece, right? The important treatment principle in the earlier mild stages is not to mistake the strength of the infectious agent. So where a normal course of treatment for a mild wind heat would use milder wind clearing herbs, COVID-19 requires stronger heat toxin clearing herbs. So that's that toxic piece that we're talking about. And the highlighting factor with COVID is that the disease almost immediately progresses through to the interior into the lung symptoms and the complications are really more damp 
than they are wind or phlegm. And so the usual treatment for these symptoms are not as effective. Damp and TCM tends to refer more to the initial inflammatory stages of an immune response. Um, and as we said before, it's sort of intractable. It's, it's a little sticky, it's hard to get rid of, right? And then phlegm is kind of what happens to damp when it's left unchecked, right? So we see this in the usual presentation, right? Of the pneumonia that gets associated with COVID. It's not phlegm obstructing the lungs. It's actual lung tissue damage. And so those are interesting things to keep in mind. Um, and as with most cases of external wind invasion in Chinese medicine today, the treatment for COVID-19 changes depending on what stage your body is in. Primarily through the difference is to treat the toxin with strong cold antimicrobial herbs to also treat the internal damp accumulation and to also strengthen the qi. I just wanted to jump back in here and speak to the concept of tonifying chi. One of the other anecdotal things that I've noticed um, even early on in the pandemic when I was consulting for patients was this concept of people with no appetite and yet the really strong importance of making sure you nourish your body, that people were feeling better when they ate food, even though they didn't necessarily have the appetite to eat. So remembering to keep your body well nourished while you're going through an illness like this is another piece of that puzzle. You wouldn't normally tonify chi in an external wind invasion, but in a case of COVID, tonifying chi um, and nourishing the body's resources is actually an important piece of the treatment principle. So if you like learning about TCM and these talks, please go to the website and sign up for our newsletter. I do this every two weeks and I've got a bunch of topics that I'd love to share with you. Our next lecture is going to be about the meridians, where we'll talk about all of the ways that the, uh, the highways of the body connect to the different organs and the acupuncture points. Um, and I know that's a, a subject that fascinates a lot of my patients. So if that interests you, you should go ahead and, and sign up and tune in. I only send out newsletter once a week, and my goal with that is that it's short and sweet and really feels uplifting to you because our inboxes are all too busy. Um, remember that I also have free 20-minute consultations, so you can ask me anything, and I'm happy to listen and help you figure out if TCM is the right tool for you and your health condition. Um, with that said, uh, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and answer them now or ask them now. I'll go ahead and stop the recording and... Um, and hopefully, I'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much.